Good morning, folks. It's a pleasure to be here. I didn't realize I was uh, filling in for Pastor Kistler. It's some tough shoes to fill. So, so the pressure is on. Um, I do appreciate uh, your consideration of uh, having me here to preach. And it is a Never been here before, so it's a, a new experience for my wife and I. We're glad to be here. Beautiful area. We got here, and uh, sunshine is, uh, it always makes it much uh, nicer. If you will, please turn to John chapter 8. That'll be our text for today. John chapter 8. And uh, let me begin with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for your goodness to us. I thank you for uh, your abundant grace that you extend to us each and every day. And Lord, uh, I just pray that today as we gather together that you would uh, bless your word as it goes forth. Uh, help this preacher to preach in the power of your spirit. We pray that we would see Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. G. Campbell Morgan was a candidate to become a minister for the Wesleyan Church uh, in 1888. Uh, he passed the doctrinal exam uh, pretty handily, but then the, uh, the preaching um, evaluation uh, was next. And uh, on the day appointed, he walked into a cavernous uh, auditorium, seats well over a thousand people, and in that huge auditorium sat three uh, ministers on the front row. <laughs> and there were a few other students and so on scattered throughout, but as he stepped into the pulpit, you know, the size of the venue as well as the critical eyes that were looking up at him um, kind of unnerved him and um, it, it affected his delivery. Two weeks later, uh, there was posted you know, a list of those who were accepted and those who had been rejected for the ministry. And there, G. Campbell Morgan's name right in the middle of the rejected list, he found his name. Obviously, he was somewhat disappointed. He wrote in his diary, extremely dark, everything seems. Um, but he is still good. And uh, his daughter-in-law, Jill Morgan, uh, she later wrote uh, his autobiography, or excuse me, his biography, not his autobiography, but his biography. And in it, she recorded um, uh, an instance regarding this, uh, this situation. And she records how he had wired a message to his father. And the message included one word, rejected. And his father quickly replied, and he received the wire back from his father, and he said, rejected on earth, but accepted in heaven. Dad. <laughs> Great dad. And um, no one enjoys rejection. It's not something any of us look forward to, but, you know, at one time or another, we all face it. Today, however, our time is not to be spent considering the rejection or the acceptance we may have felt or we may be feeling in life, but rather our attention is on someone who cannot be ignored, someone whom we must either accept or reject. And that takes us to John chapter 8, and beginning in verse 48, if you'll look in your Bibles and uh, just follow along as I read. Beginning in verse 48, the Bible says, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan, and hast a devil? Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and you do dishonor me. And I seek not my own glory, but is, uh, there is one that seeketh and judges. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are dead? Who makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. 
It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his sayings. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. When we study the life of Jesus Christ, the end conclusion is this. We must either accept him or reject him. There's no middle ground when it comes to Christ. Historian Philip Schaff described the overwhelming influence which Jesus had on uh, subsequent history and the culture of the world. And he writes this, he says, This Jesus of Nazareth, without money and arms, conquered more millions than Alexander, Caesar, Mohammed, and Napoleon combined. Without science, he shed more light on things human and divine than all the philosophers and scholars combined. Without the eloquence of schools, he spoke such words of life as were never spoken before or since and produced effects which lie beyond the reach of orator or poet. Without writing a single line, he set more pens in motion and furnished themes for more sermons and orations and discussions, learned volumes, works of art, and songs of praise than the whole army of great men of ancient and modern times. The success of Jesus throughout history didn't come easy. As we know, the Jewish leaders and Jesus uh, had considerable disagreements throughout his earthly ministry. The Bible says Jesus came unto his own, but his own received them not. He was not the kind of Messiah that the religious leaders of his day wanted. And so as a result, they rejected him and hated him and eventually crucified him. In the Gospel of John, chapter 8 alone, we observe conflict in, on the very beginning portions of this uh, chapter, we see the woman caught in adultery. And it's quite the scene that starts this chapter, and the religious leaders uh, had wanted to pit Jesus against the law of Moses and put him in a a precarious position in in regard to uh, his relationship with the, uh, the law of Rome. And so they set this woman that is caught in the act of adultery. And we know this is a setup, by the way, because there's no man at all involved. They they grabbed this woman and and, uh, they put him there and wanted to see what Jesus uh, would do about her. If Jesus chose to let her go, they would charge him of going against the law of Moses. If he goes along with them then, and, and says she should be stoned, uh, then he would be in trouble with the, uh, with the Roman law. You know, stoning without Roman permission was against Roman law. And, um, uh, but instead, Jesus, you know, instead of Jesus being snared by them, he turned it all back on them and he wrote on the sand and, and basically they walked away guilty and convicted. And uh, as they pointed at the woman, they discovered that the fingers were pointing right back at them. In this passage is one of Jesus' great I am uh, statements. And he made a number of them. And each of Jesus' I am statements declared and defined his deity. And throughout his earthly ministry, Jesus had established his identity without any doubt through miracles and through his teachings and, and through his character. And while the setting of this passage in John chapter 8 was some 2,000 or some years ago, uh, the identity of Jesus is still an issue today. Many people agree that he was a a good man. They say that he was a a good teacher. Many would agree that, that he was a holy man, unique in so many ways. And especially in light of how, the, how dark the world has gotten and it's, it's, it's uh, uh, plunging into paganism today. You know, people, even people that aren't saved would say that, that there's some real value in biblical v- teaching and biblical uh, principles to keep a society sane and, and civilized. He would say it's good for society. Many would say that his teachings were revolutionary in a good way. 
But the things that he said in today's text are what one person has said to be the most shocking thing that has ever been uttered by, the human, by human lips. And so we'll find in our study of John chapter 8, as we read, four claims that Jesus made in regard to his identity. The first claim Jesus made concerned his exaltation in verses 48 and 50, or 48 through 50. When Jesus keeps refuting their arguments, they're trying to trip him up, they're trying to snare him, and he's just, they're no match for him. He, he just befuddles them at every turn, you know, and he embarrasses them and he incriminates them and, and, and they're frustrated. When Jesus keeps refuting their arguments, the Jewish leaders resort to insults. It's been said that when foes begin to insult you rather than address you, that you have won the debate. And um, I suspect that's true. It certainly get that impression here. And it, it's turned, uh, uh, they've, they've turned now to angry verbal attacks against him. They were pulling out all the stops. They accused Jesus of being a Samaritan. And the Jewish leaders in that day hated the Samaritans. The Samaritans were half-breeds. The Samaritans were, uh, you, you know, they, they were less than, than noble. They, in, in many of their minds, the Samaritans were worse than the Gentiles. They accused Jesus of being a Jewish half-breed, of having a, a demon, of being demonic. They'd say he was a non-Jew and... Uh, the uh, implication is that, you know, I think uh, the belief is that many in that day knew that Mary was a virtuous young lady. And they, they surmised, they knew that Joseph wasn't Jesus' father. And so they, they assumed that Mary had been raped by one or more of the uh, Roman soldiers, which would not have been an unusual occurrence in that day. And so they, obviously, they wouldn't impugn Mary because she was a virtuous woman. She had proven her, her, her uh, spirituality uh, to them. But yet, you know, she was a victim of some Gentile crime. And uh, Jesus, however, he was a half-breed. And, and so they would, they would throw that accusation at him. They would say that he was a heretic because he had no respect, uh, respect for the teaching of the leaders. You know, therefore, he was demonic since he didn't agree with them. And uh, they would say it was him, not them, that was under diabolical control of Satan. But their accusations are once again uh, stayed and stilled, you know, because these things don't fit Jesus. You know, what, what, what was Jesus, uh, what was Satan's primary characteristic? He was a liar. He was a murderer. He was hateful. He was proud. He was self-centered. None of these things characterize Jesus. If Jesus was an offspring of Satan, then he would, his characteristics would mark him, but they don't mark him. Rather, they mark the very leaders who are pointing the finger at him. It's amazing how those kind of things go. But Jesus, for example, wasn't seeking temporal fame or glory for himself. As he says in verse 50, he says, I seek not mine own glory. Jesus didn't come here thumping his chest and, and puffing it out and saying, look at me, I am great, I am God. He didn't, he didn't come out and, and, and demand that people bow before him and worship him. He didn't honor himself. It's interesting he doesn't even answer the accusation about being a Samaritan. <laughs> Apparently, uh, the offense, the insult that the, the leaders wanted to level at him wasn't really an insult to Jesus. Jesus loved Samaritans. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't insulted at all. He didn't even bother to address that accusation, even though he wasn't a Samaritan. It probably didn't bother him quite as much as he had hoped. You know, the successive uh, accusation, he just quietly dismisses, and then he moves on to his main theme. He says, the Father has sent me. And, uh, the, and uh, the Father sends him, and he honors the Father, and the Father likewise honors him. His honor, his glory, his exaltation is not from himself, but from God the Father. The Jewish father was concerned about his son. You know, he had not been strictly raised in the grounding of, of the Jewish faith. 
you know, and, and his son was being influenced by the secularism of the, of, of the times and everything. And so the father, in order to uh, try to reestablish the, the roots of, of his Jewish heritage in his son, sent him to Israel. And his, his boy was in Israel and establishing his, uh, uh, his heritage and so on, getting, getting a hold of that. And a year later, the, the son comes back and he says, Father, thank you for sending me to the land of our home of our fathers. It was wonderful. It was enlightening. However, I must confess that while I was in Israel, I converted to Christianity. And the Jewish father threw his hands up. Oh, oy vey, you know, what am I going to do? What have I done? I've destroyed my son. And he was so distraught and no amount of arguing or trying to dissuade his son would work. And he was just beside himself. And the father, you know, walked out of the house and, and he's walking down the street, just, you know, what am I going to do? What have I done to my son? And as he's walking down uh, the street, he walks by the house of a friend he hadn't talked to in many years, a an old friend that he knew known since he was a, 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 a youngster. A and he knocks on his door. And the friend answers the door and says, Jacob, why, what are you doing here? Good to see you. What's happening? And Jacob, oh, and he just, tear, he just tells him all about the tragedy of sending his son to Israel, and his son came back a Christian, and, and what is he going to do? And Jacob says, my friend, funny you should come to me. I, too, have sent my son to Israel, and he has come back a Christian. Oh, and they both just start oh, just going over the top and hanging on each other and weeping and wailing and, and crying, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And, and the friend says, I know what we will do. Let, let us go to the rabbi. We'll go to the rabbi and he will know what to do. He will tell us uh, how we should approach this, this, this tragedy in our lives. And so together they go down to the rabbi and uh, they go down to the synagogue and they go to the house next door and knock on the door and the rabbi comes out and he says, brothers, why, what, what can I do for you? And they both, you know, together, they're just stumbling over each other, telling them about the, the tragedy of their sons going to Israel and coming back Christians, and, and, and they're just going on and on and weeping, and what should we do? What should we do, Rabbi? And the rabbi very solemnly said, Brothers, funny you should come to me. I, too, have sent my son to Israel, and he has come back a Christian. And oh, and again, they all hang on each other and they're crying and weeping and, and they don't know what to do. And, and, and the rabbi speaks up, brothers, this is what we shall do. Together we will get on our faces before the Almighty and cry out to the Almighty and he will direct us as to what we should do. And so right there, they, they all bowed their heads and began to, to, to pray in, uh, in all together, you know, and just, just praying all together, praying to God and crying out to God for mercy and crying out to God for wisdom and what they should do. And suddenly, the sky is opened up. And, a, and, a, and a, a bright light, so bright that it was blinding, uh, came and shone upon them. And a booming voice as the voice of many waters spoke and said, funny you should come to me. I too have sent my son to Israel. Um, Jesus knew, the point of that was that Jesus knew who sent him. Jesus knew why he was there. He came because the Father had sent him. He was keenly aware that he was sent. He was keenly aware that, that he had a purpose. He was supremely aware of his high dignity. He knew who he was. And while he was aware of these things, he consistently speaks in terms of obedience and service. He was God the Son, but yet he says, I am here to obey. I am here to uh, submit. And, and um, Jesus was not in this simply for himself. This becomes abundantly clear in the Garden of Gethsemane and at Calvary where he, he prays, not my will but yours be done. He exalts the Father. The second claim that Jesus made was in regard to his eternity, his eternality. In 51 through 53, you know, we'll, we'll never die if you're followers of Jesus Christ. We know that. 
when the word of Jesus is in us and we obey the Lord and we accept Christ and Jesus says that, that the believer will not even notice death. Literally, the word here is death he will not see. It's not that he doesn't experience it. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that the rapture comes and I, and I don't experience it. But, you know, the, the, uh, but the, the point here is that even though we may pass from this life, and the, we're not even going to notice death. The believer takes little notice of death. It's just a blimp in our eternal memory bank. You know, a little blip, just here and there. It's like when we walk through the front doors. You know, you came from the sunshine outside there, and you walked into these doors, and now you're in the house of God. How many of you have really considered, you know, what it was like walking through those doors? I mean, it's just, it, it, we didn't even think about it. We just walked through. And then we were greeted graciously by the, uh, by the greeters there. Uh, but... You know, that's, for the Christian, that's what heaven is. It's a, uh, that's what death is. It's a, it's a doorway. We're stepping from this reality into our eternal reality uh, with God. And uh, that's what we are looking forward to. Why, is, why, why doesn't the Christian even notice death? Because it's a non-issue for us. Before we, before we were saved, it was an issue. It was something that, you know, what happens after I'm gone? What happens if I get in an accident? What happens then? We had no answers. Now we have answers. We know. If you're in Christ today, then, then death is not an issue. It's a transition. Physical death is a promotion to eternal life. This is why our funeral services and the Christian churches are, uh, have a celebratory yet very somber. I mean, we still have sorrow and we, we miss our loved ones, but yet we know we're going to see them again. We know that they're in, in, in the Lord's presence. They're enjoying his, his, his bliss uh, with him. And we don't sorrow as the world sorrows for our de departed loved ones who have died in the Lord. We know we're going to see them again. As Jesus talks about death, he directs our attention to his eternality, his timelessness. The Jewish leaders are befuddled here. Uh, they can't fathom the statement that Jesus is making. Jesus implies that, that he has what the ancients do not have. You know, they said, well, wait a minute, Abraham died, and the prophets died, and all these others died, and, and, and Jesus is saying, I have power over death. So their response is, can you truly be greater than Abraham? Is that what you're saying? You know, come on now, we can't believe that, that you're, you're greater than Abraham. That's unbelievable. And then they say, who do you think you are? They don't say God, but I think they imply, who do you think you are, God? God's the only one that is eternal. And what is truly difficult for them is that Jesus is, is fully aware of the implications of what he's saying, and he still says it. He knows how they're taking it. He knows what he's implying. It's not a mistake. It's not a misspeak, uh, misspeaking here. He, what he's saying is exactly what he means. And that just, just does not comprehend with them. For what Jesus implies here is that he is greater than Abraham. He is greater than Moses. He is greater than the prophets. He is greater than Elijah and all the other heroes of the faith in the Old Testament. He is bigger than the ancients. He is superior over death, so much so that he can prevent it. He says, anybody that believes in me shall never die, shall never see death. This means that he is over death, that he is timeless, that he is eternal, that he is the one who holds life and death in his hands. He is the giver and taker of life. The Jews correctly understood that only God fits this description. Jesus was declaring his deity. The third claim that Jesus made was in regard to expectation. In verses 54 through 56, Jesus establishes some confidence in the relationship he has with his father. Jesus acknowledges that self-glorification would be discounted. It means nothing. If he was going around you know, praising himself and saying, look at me, look at me, look at me, that would mean nothing. But this doesn't mean that Jesus went without praise or that he goes without praise. He does receive praise. He does receive honor from the father. 
Jesus has confidence about his relationship with the Father. He has faith in that relationship, for he knows that the Father is with him, that the Father will always be with him until he takes our sin upon himself on the cross, obviously. But as he exalts the Father, the Father likewise exalts him. You know, Jesus makes it clear that this was not true for the Jewish leaders. They don't know God. They don't have a relationship with God the Father. What Abraham was asked to do, the reference to Abraham, Abraham was asked to take his son, his only son, to Mount Moriah and there sacrifice him to God. Abraham knew that God would provide a lamb. And what Abraham was asked to do, God has now done. God has provided his son to be a sacrifice. You know, and he has offered his only son. And Abraham believed in the one that God would send, the, the Lamb of God, the, the Redeemer, the one who would come from his offspring and, and would bring salvation to the world. And the Bible says that he rejoiced in the knowledge that Messiah would come from his descendants. Abraham rejoiced to see that day, and now it had arrived in the person of Jesus Christ. The truth of the matter is that Jesus met the expectation not only of Abraham, but of the entire Old Testament. Pastor Ray Stedman puts it this way. I quote, He can be seen in every king of Israel. He is prefigured in every prophet who spoke. He is spoken of in every sacrifice on every Jewish altar. He is described in every ritual which they performed. He is foreseen in the tabernacle and in the temple. He is anticipated by every longing and yearning expressed in the Old Testament for something better than what men already had. The fourth claim that Jesus made was in regard to his essence in verses 57 through 58. You know, Jewish leaders, again, they don't quite know what to do with this thing about Abraham and his eternality and so on, but Jesus was implying that he was before Abraham that Jesus preceded Abraham. How can Jesus claim to be ancient, ancient, they said in their mind, when he's not even 50 years old? He's not even getting close to being an old man yet, and, and yet he's older than the ancients. But we know that Jesus does precede them, God the Son. He preceded the, the very creation of, of this world, of this universe. Over against Abraham's fleeting span of life, Jesus places his own timeless presence. And in doing so, he makes the claim that he is the self-existent one, the I am, as he says here. You know, Jesus used the holy name of God from, from Exodus chapter 3 to refer to himself. I am that I am. I am what I am. You know, Jesus said clearly and unashamedly, as they said, you know, who do you think you are? Implying God? And Jesus said very, uh, very boldly, yes, I am. I am that I am. I am. He stated that he was not dependent on anyone else. He was not created in his being, in his person, his essence, there was deity. There was eternality. He is a self-existent. He didn't have to depend on anything or anyone to exist. He exists in and of himself. I know that's kind of hard to wrap our minds around, but that is our God. Our God is a transcendent God. Our God is far beyond. Sometimes we, we put God in a box of our own imaginations, and we imagine this is what he's like. Brethren, we... We only have a, a thimbleful, a glimpse, perhaps, of what our God is like. He is so much greater than we could ever comprehend. He is so much more than we could ever imagine. That is our God. So notice how they responded to Jesus' declarations here. In verse 59, they picked up stones to throw at him. The Bible says he hid himself and went out of the temple. It wasn't his time yet. The Jewish leaders finally had the charge they were looking for. Blasphemy. He's making himself God. He is saying, I am the I am. And for some reason, if for some re 
reason you or maybe someone you, you know doesn't believe that Jesus ever meant to say he was God, well, then believe the words of the Jewish leaders. They certainly understood what he was saying. They knew that he was making himself God. You know, they became so aroused by his claim that they were ready to take the law in their own hands. And what they had tried to trick Jesus into doing and condemning the, the, the woman caught in adultery, they were ready to take stones and they were going to face the wrath of Rome. They didn't care as long as they were to, able to kill this blasphemer. The charge of blasphemy. In the Jewish mind, this was the ultimate insult against God. Blasphemy is a creature claiming to be the creator. It's the height of irreverence. It's the height of impiety. You know, what is interesting to note is that Jesus made no effort whatsoever to correct them as, you know, that they are mistaken. He wasn't saying he was, he never says that. He just, he knew what they were thinking. He knew what they accused him of. They were going to, he didn't go back and try to argue his way out of it. He told them exactly who he was, and they rejected him for that. He doesn't attempt to placate them, doesn't attempt to compromise with them or to calm them down. Instead, he enrages them almost, it seems, deliberately, claiming things that he knows they will not accept. And then he leaves. They can't find him because his work is not yet done. He knows he's headed for that cross. But they will have their evil day. But it will be according to God's timing and not their own. Just as the Jewish leaders were faced with choices about Jesus, so are we. And I believe probably most of us have heard um, C.S. Lewis's uh, argument for Jesus being Lord. And I won't belabor all that, but uh, he basically says that you either have to say that Jesus was a lunatic who thought he was God, but was really a madman, or he was a liar who was just a deceiver who lied so much and, you know, he apparently must have deceived himself because he wound up taking it right to the cross, or he is Lord. So we have a choice. Is Jesus a liar? Is he a lunatic? Or is he Lord? It's your choice. It's the individual's choice. Call him Lord and Savior now, or call him Lord and judge later. Either way, we're going to call him Lord. If we recognize him as Lord and Savior now, then it is time for us to worship. It is time to exalt his name, to, to recognize him for who he is. And, and we do that. We come here and we sing praise to his name. We pray to him. We trust in him. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. He is our Master. We, we are his, uh, we are his, uh, his children. His brethren, even. You know, we're to give him the reverence and honor that he deserves. We're to be gone with the idea that Jesus is just all right, that he is just our pal. We need to take into account that all that we owe him, he gave his life for us. We owe him. The least that we owe him is loyal service, is devotion in our lives. And when we do so, we will realize that he deserves more than just half spirited praise. He deserves more than just an hour on Sunday or two hours on Sunday. He deserves more than just a day of the week. He deserves all that we have. The Bible says we are called to love him with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. That's true worship. An evidence of, of a choice that accepts and receives Jesus as Lord all of our mind, all of our strength, all of our time. It doesn't mean, I mean, while we're working, while we're living our lives throughout the week, we need to be worshiping and living for the Lord. We need to recognize that he is our God. He is our Lord. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Follow me. He says, I am the bread of life. Feast upon me. I am the light of the world. Open your eyes and see the truth. I am the door, enter only through me. I am the true vine, abide in me. I am the resurrection and the life, find your life and existence in me. I am the way, walk with me. I am the truth, trust me. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, worship me. 
Before Abraham was, I am. Will you receive him? Do you recognize, acknowledge, and accept and believe that Jesus is who he says he is? That he is the creator, he is the almighty, he is the king of kings, he is the holy one of Israel, he is God in the flesh? If, he, if you accept that, then you should humble yourself before him, if you haven't already. Or you can either accept him or reject him and, a few, and refuse to accept his authority in your life. You see, when it comes to Jesus, there are two clear choices with two clear, eternal, polar opposite consequences. Again, who is Jesus? The choice is yours. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for your son. We thank you, Lord, for the, the glorious plan of redemption that the Godhead you all have put together with us in mind. We pray, Father, that you would speak to hearts today. Lord, perhaps for someone here that doesn't know you as personal savior, I pray that you would work in those hearts and draw them to yourself. Maybe there's someone here that's not living for you, that's not giving you the honor and the worship uh, that you deserve in their daily lives. I pray, Father, that you would work in those hearts as well. Whatever your will might be, I pray that you would accomplish it through this service today. In Jesus' name, amen.